Montreal led to a sellout tour of South America and a new audience worldwide. Henry Miller and the people, they got together and they had planned a tour of South America and started in Cuba. That was before Castro. He was fascinated by the language and by the, and this nightclub had the greatest show in the world. It had a miniature opera and the singers came from out of the woodwork and out of the trees, you know. And he would sit out there and watch them and all of a sudden he became, he loved the music, he loved the band, he loved everything about it. And he kept saying, I'm going to record this stuff. I'm going to record this. Uh, Nat, how do you solve the language problem when you're abroad? Well, it's kind of hard to solve it, Ed, because uh, you just sing what you're supposed to sing and let them try to figure you out instead, you know? <laughs> but uh, I, I found that when we did a little traveling over in Europe a few years back, we did go to a particular place in Switzerland, and uh, the fellow was singing a song when I walked in the club, my wife and I, and he was singing Route 66, exactly like I do it, word for word, and when he came over to, to meet me, we had to get an interpreter <laughs> to talk for us. But, so they figured out our language would be much easier than it would be for me to. It's the Barnum and Bailey world, just as phony as it can be. When Cole first visited Europe, he encountered audiences who knew him only as a jazz musician. We laughed, though, about the provinces. Oh, I think for years we talked about the provinces. <laughs> Those one-nighters, these towns like Manchester and Birmingham and no heat. I remember being so cold a couple of those places I put Nat's overcoat over me at night. And, but it was, it was a wonderful experience, except that also was a time, Jim, remembering things, as you see, that Nat was so hurt because he was not a success the first time he went to London. He, he was a very sensitive man when it came to his work. Uh, it was very important to him that he please people because he was already a complete smash, you know, in the States. You know, all evening I've been in this same suit and I guess it's about time I made a little change. So will you excuse me while I make this big change? I'll be back in just one minute. When Cole first visited Europe, he encountered audiences who knew him only as a jazz musician. Uh, it was a real interesting tour because, I mean, he's one of my favorite musicians and a very influential musician. Uh, and we played a couple of places like Switzerland, and the people didn't want to hear him sing commercial songs. They wanted to hear him play piano. I love you. Yes, I do. And that, in a way, was kind of cornered. And it didn't matter because he has the ambidexterity to go both ways. And so he came out. We, we finished our first hour, and the people were really screaming. You know, we were happy and everything else. But then we started to announce Nat, and they kept screaming for the band to play more. And he kept saying, go back out there and go back out there and play. Go back out there and play. And I said, no, you come out there and play piano. And from there on in, we put the piano in the band. And it was just, I mean, he played p featured piano, and it was beautiful. I imagine there are probably some fans who remember me when I broke into show business as a youngster about three or four years ago. <laughs> and I tried to explain to them that carrying this thing around the country and all over the world is quite heavy, you see. Imagine rushing up to catch a plane at the last moment, you walk up to the airline ticket window and you say, check us in. <laughs> That's when you find out why they call this a grand piano, because it costs just about that much to ship it. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, though, I still love a piano. The second time when we went back, I remember us being in the dressing room and standing there and saying a prayer and closing out, crossing our fingers. But that I remember distinctly. And he went out there and oh boy. 
first surprise of London's Victoria Palace when the Queen arrived with Prince Philip for the Royal Variety Show, the yeomen lining the stairs. They were crazy yeomen, the crazy gang in disguise. Among stars lucky enough to be presented were Marion Ryan, a big thrill for her, as it was for Lonnie Donegan. Adam Faith was another. Now Jackie Ray and Benny Lee. Billy Cotton next. And there's Nat King Cole. The Royal Variety performance. Oh, he liked that. I still have that hat. It's all faded now, the top hat. Um, he liked that very much. He liked meeting them very much. He liked uh, uh, her husband. He was sort of a joker, you know, and they were big fans of Nat. And uh, it was a, a very, uh, a very inspiring evening for him. I remember he liked it very much. No matter how successful Cole was commercially, he never entirely abandoned his roots in jazz. After his success in Europe, he made a recording with the great English jazz pianist George Shearing, whose own style was reminiscent of the original Nat King Cole trio. We did our album together in, I believe, 61 or 62. And this man always had such a fresh approach to any of his music. I mean, for instance, during one of the preliminary meetings leading up to this recording session, <clears throat> Nat suggested that we do pick yourself up. And I'd been playing it with the quintet since 1949. And having grown a little musically, I thought, well, this is kind of a silly tempo I've been playing this. And so I said, oh, you really want to do that, Nat? And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, you know, pick yourself up. Oh, I said, very well. I said, very well. You know, because he had given me a, a completely new idea. Start all over again. Nothing's impossible. I have found for when my chin is on the ground. I pick myself up, dust myself off, and start all over again. To this day, that remains perhaps the most pleasurable of albums I've done. Here's a song that I had the pleasure of recording some months ago with George Shearing, which was quite a delight. Of course, I don't have the services of George Shearing here tonight on the piano to help me, so I guess I'll have to do a little double duty. It's a little song called Let There Be Love. <laughs> Las Vegas is the highest paid venue in the world. In the early 60s, Cole was a regular attraction. But most of all, please, let there be love. I met Nat Cole in Las Vegas at the Sands Hotel in the lounge, and he was working in the big room, of course, big star. And uh, he would come in to hear my little trio because we finally realized that we had so much in common. He started with a trio, I started with a trio, 
he had perfect pitch, I have perfect pitch. We both made it as commercial singers, but we are basically jazz piano players. So we realized that we had so much in common that we became very dear friends. And actually, I fashioned my career, my whole singing style and piano style, uh, when I first started after Nat. One night, I, I kind of was sneaking in to hear him play, and Mr. Sinatra walked in. And I'll never forget this. We sat down at the last booth, and when he just came out and he started to do a couple of his songs, Frank Sinatra looked at me and just went, here we go. And we just sat down for about an hour and a half and just enjoyed everything. They were very, very dear friends. Well, when you travel all around the world and meet all sorts of people, you become something of a philosopher, you know, like we all think that we are philosophers and we ask the same age-old questions. What is life? What's this all about? Where am I going? Where am I going to park? He had a great restlessness in him. He, not only was there always the constant anxiety about career, we all had it. How long is it going to last for us? Because there was no, there was no barometer for what happened to black p people who had cut across the barrier. How does the end come when it comes? When will it come? Uh, how does one sustain one's career? All those questions that every artist has, regardless of color, not only exists within the black psyche in terms of dealing with this business, but also the very specific thing that happens in terms of the limitations that are placed on us in terms of our longevity, certainly then. How do you protect the gains we have made? If white artists were beginning to make the leap from pop singer in the record market into Hollywood and into large parts musically, and that, that he did not want to be denied the ability to do the same thing, except that things would have to have been specially written for him. So in the last years of his life, one would see Nat more and more becoming involved in, in getting into pictures, playing parts, trying to be a dramatic actor, albeit that his image as a singer was so powerful, so pervasive that a lot of times his believability in certain roles didn't come across. So therefore, he was more diminished in terms of how often people sought after him. The last film Cole worked on was Cat Ballou. During the shooting, he was commuting between Las Vegas and Hollywood. He was taken ill while performing in Las Vegas, and his doctor advised him to rest. But he carried on working. Cat, your time has come As you stand on the brink It's sure making you think I don't know when, what night anyway, he came to me, he was getting ready to go on stage, uh, getting ready to get dressed, and he said, uh, I'm losing weight, uh, cut a hole in that belt. Now there's a wardrobe mitts right down the way, and his valet is, I've got a valet there, and he's getting ready, and I see him take a, a knife out, and he's cutting, I said, what the hell are you doing? He said, Nat told me to cut, I said, take it down there and have a hole put in the that damn belt. You're not ready to deal with him because he's getting ready to cut through this uh, mohair material, sort of um, was green, a very dark shade of green. Not, I know it wasn't a dark shade, it was in between, like, uh, anyway, it was a pretty mohair piece. And I don't get down there and get it done. So I walk in the room there and I'm sitting there. Now, he was smoking, but he burnt out more cigarette than he smoked because he had the nicotine holder. And he put a cigarette and he laid it in the ashtray and it would lay there. And he never took as many draws on cigarettes as people thought he did because it would burn out. And, uh, but he didn't, he wasn't coughing. 